Hey everyone, welcome to our fall version, or could it be the spring version of spring. Keymasters? Yeah, We've got yeah. Sven Ryla here for another Keymaster episode with David Hook from the Down Under of the Legions of Bouncy Castle. And we're going to dive into chems today. So David, what is a chem? So chem is, uh, chem just stands for key encapsulation mechanism. Key encapsulation mechanism, chem. Yeah. So they're uh, basically uh, cryptographic primitives that allow the establishment of a uh, secret to be shared between two parties. So how is that going to change things in relation, like how is this different from what we're doing today? Okay, so the first thing is um, basically the, the chem primitive itself actually generates a shared secret. Normally with these protocols, we either do calculations like we do with Diffie-Hellman, where uh, you know you use a couple of Diffie-Hellman keys and you arrive at a, an agreed calculation which mm -hmm. becomes the shared value between all the parties. Or in the case of RSA, you'd actually generate a secret value which you would then encrypt using the receiving party's RSA public key, send to them, and then they recover that secret value using their um, private key. With a chem, what actually happens is you use the you use the other party's public key to generate what's called an encapsulation, and as part of that process, that also gives you this shared secret oh. that the other party will actually recover when they receive the encapsulation you send them that's been generated from their public key. So this is actually going to change. This would change Diffie Hellman and the way we're doing RSA today. Yeah, yeah. These it, it's got a foot in both camps, a bit like how we're in fall and spring at the same time in the same video. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, the the reality is that you know all those protocols will probably need to be changed. Even TLS too. Yep, TLS as well. There will be changes to TLS in terms of how that level of the handshake is uh, controlled. Um, but basically, I, I think from TLS's standpoint, you know, it'll be transparent to people using the protocols. It'll be taken care of in the actual protocol itself. Well, then how is that going to change how I interoperate with PKI then today? So the real change there is the other thing about a chem is uh, unlike, say, RSA, where you can actually generate a... A P10, yeah, right? Yeah, that's what it's a generator signature uh, and then use the key for encryption, providing you never use it for generating signatures again, because we all know it's a bit naughty. Yeah. Um, with a chem, you can't actually generate a signature at all. Oh. So what that means is that when you're doing proof of possession, you actually need to use a protocol like CRMF CMP um, to actually use what's referred to as uh, something like anchor cert, so an indir indirect protocol. And usually what happens then is um, the CA will actually send you back an encrypted version of your certificate. And then you decrypt the certificate through the process of um, unpacking the encapsulation that the CA sends you generated using a public key. And then you send back the CA a hash of the certificate to show that you've actually been able to so successfully decrypt it. A lot more communication in the path than yeah. it was a lot more simple to submit a CSR, get a key back. But now yeah. there's a lot more to that process. Yeah, I mean, wow. the, the, the big change, of course, is that the CA can't just generate the certificate from the certification request and throw it up. Well, it, it shouldn't it because should, yeah. it's got no proof of possession until it actually receives that second uh, message with the hash in it. So how does that change? I mean, what should people then think about as they start migrating towards chems? What do they need to keep in mind if they're going to, they want to start using them, migrate from traditional to a chem? Yeah, so I guess we've kind of covered the two most important things. The, the first one is, yeah, that it's not a key agreement. And it's not RSA block encryption or Elgamal. You know, they've kind of got a foot in both camps. Um, you need to take into account the fact that the chem itself would generate the secret. And also that uh, usually uh, the way these things are designed is they're supposed to be used in conjunction with KDFs as well, which again makes them a bit like key agreement, but not. Um, you can't do multi-multi-party protocols, like three or four people all at once, like you can with traditional Diffie-Hellman, for example. Oh, right. It's more like RSA in the sense that it's only a one point to one point, yeah. And then, of course, yeah, there's the whole thing with uh, generating certificates, which is, you know, you need to keep in mind you can't generate a signature. So anything that requires uh, some level of authentication or proof of possession uh, actually needs, you know, a two-step process. Yeah. Yeah. Then I guess if people want to learn more, where would you recommend they could go read up more about this? 
because I'm obviously interested. So where would you tell me to go? Uh, okay, so there's a couple of things I'd suggest. Um, there's some excellent RFCs actually just getting published now, particularly the one on the Chem Recipient Info, uh, 9296, which 9296. just got published in the last two weeks, Ooh, I think. It's fresh. And then, of course, there's the actual uh, FIPS standard, SP800-203. The, the ML Chem. Yep, ML Chem. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there'll probably be blog posts and various other things appearing, uh, certainly from us and others. Okay. Yeah. Well, there we go, guys. That's, that's Chem in a nutshell. So stay tuned for the next episode. And thank you, David, for flying up here to uh, fall. <laughs> yeah, any, any time. Spring gets my sinuses. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Take care.